What's going on, everyone? Happy Tuesday night. Getting ready to do some CCNA EIGRP configuration. Let's get ready to go here. So let's just go ahead and pull up. Hey, Jake, thanks for joining. Nate, good to see you. Let's uh, let's take a look at the agenda tonight. So we're going to be talking a little bit. Oh, well, we're walking all the way through EIGRP configuration. So last week we did OSPF. Um, this week we're going to have some fun with EIGRP. Um, I, probably go a little bit beyond CCNA tonight. We're going to be drilling into the topology table. Hope nobody minds going a little too deep. <laughs> um, hopefully it'll be a good uh, good conversation. So definitely chime in with your questions as we dive into EIGRP in a little more uh, detail than maybe what the CCNA expects us to know. So more like CCN, yay. That is nice. I like that. Um, we are going to be talking about the metrics too, um, comparing it to OSPF cost. EIGRP's metric is way more complicated than OSPF's, unfortunately. So we need to make sure we understand that as well. And then summarization is something that we can't do in single area OSPF, but we can do it with EIGRP. So we're going to, of course, take advantage of that tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and pull up our topology here. Ooh, how do we... Actually, you know what? Tell you what. We're just going to go straight here. So this should be uh, taking a look at the router configuration. You've got the topology right there in the corner. I tried to pretty up the document a little bit, so hopefully you can see it a little bit better when uh, you full screen, uh, if for those who have the luxury of full screening, I suppose. Hey, Gus, good to see you. Thanks for joining. Excellent. We're just getting started here. So um, ideally, what we're going to do tonight is just start to bring up our convergence, and we'll just kind of go from there. So eh, hold up here. What's going on? Nothing there. There we go. Okay. I think we're almost good. What is happening here? There we go. Okay. Now we're good. All right. So uh, based on this topology, which I've got to print out right in front of me because that way I don't have to keep trying to manage looking over at other screens and such. Um, let's go ahead and just focus on what EIGRP configuration looks like on a per router basis. So well, we'll go to router one here in the top left of this diagram. We've got it pulled up here already. And we're going to do a config T and do a router EIGRP question mark. Now, right away, we're greeted with the first difference between EIGRP and OSPF. Obviously, under the hood, there's a ton of differences. But just from a configuration perspective, we need to make sure that we understand the autonomous systems matter with EIGRP. OSPF, the process ID, is locally significant only. So if I get onto a router, you know, we, we last week, if, for those who were here last week, we actually saw that because we got onto two different routers and we had like OSPF one here and OSPF, I don't even remember, like 300 or something, whatever we used. And so they were mismatched, but no problem. They came right up because it's locally significant to those routers. Whereas an autonomous system, it's every router in the autonomous system. And it allows us to make sure that we're in sync with, um, well, I'm trying to think of how to say this. We could, in theory, deploy multiple autonomous systems with EIGRP, have multiple routing domains, no problem. With OSPF, we have a big problem with that. If I have two routers talking to OSPF and I enable OSPF on that link, they're going to form neighborships. If I have two OSPF domains and I try to connect them, it's going to become one OSPF domain with the risk of segmenting area zero if the two area zeros don't touch each other. So OSPF doesn't allow us to do that, EIGRP does. I've never really seen it a good idea to have two EIGRP domains. I have, I have seen it in a network. It, it did accomplish a purpose, but there are other ways to accomplish what they were setting out to do. And so generally speaking, it, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there is a use case out there that you know, benefits from having two autonomous system numbers in your network. Uh, Big Papa, good to see you, by the way. Out of curiosity, who is going to start streaming study sessions for Encore? <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, I might have to uh, do that myself here because all of y'all who have been taking the CCNA have been passing the CCNA. And so maybe it's just time to uh, step this study group up to Encore level. Um, I'm, I don't know if you're here right at the start, but EIGRP, we are going into the Encore level EIGRP a little bit here tonight, delving a little bit more into the topology table. So if you can hang around, hopefully you'll be entertained. So, okay, um, router EIGRP. So let's go ahead and get this fired up. I know this is the basics, but we got to get spun up, right? So we'll just choose autonomous system number 100 tonight. And one thing that we talked about last week that we did not demonstrate is passive interface. And let's be a little, I want to be a little real tonight. So we're talking like real world scenarios. 
we should probably, not probably, best practice is certainly to enable passive interface default. So we're going to do that on our router here, passive interface default. And remember what passive interface does. Um, in order to remember what passive interface does, we need to back up and remember what the network statement does because I've tried to drill that home. I've said it a hundred times by now. So, you, well, most of you probably understand it. A network statement activates interfaces. And yes, one statement can activate many interfaces. So anything, I, whatever I put in for my network statement, if I put in a slash 24, for example, every network address that matches that, 24, that slash 24 is going that those interfaces will be activated. Once that interface has been activated, two things happen. One, the routing process will look at that subnet and say, I'm going to advertise that into the routing protocol. But the other thing it does is it starts sending hellos out, saying, I'm gonna find a neighbor out this interface. And number one, you might find a neighbor you didn't want to find. And number two, at a minimum, you're sending multicast out um, out towards the network and nobody actually wants to listen to it. Probably not the worst thing in the world. Um, but at the same time, let's just make our networks clean. Best practice this. So uh, passive interface disable it, it active. You know we're still dealing with an active interface. We're still advertising that subnet into the network or into the routing process, but we're no longer sending hellos out that interface. So yeah, so absolutely, you yeah, using passive interface default. Hopefully, it's something that you'll see out on the network. So um, but then of course we have to disable passive interface. Passive interface default may be a little clear what it's doing, but it actually enables passive interface on every interface. And of course we do want some EWG RP neighbors. So let's go ahead and get those turned on. We'll do a no passive interface on gig one zero and on gig two zero. How's the drawing working out? I tried to redo it today. Does it, do the numbers need to be bigger or are they, are they pretty good at this point? I'm kind of curious. Give me, give me some feedback on that guys. Um, all right, in fact, we're going to, actually, no, let's go and do our network statements next. So network statement, we'll go ahead and do, here's another best practice concept. So we we usually wanna use all zeros for our wildcard masks. If we remember, that's because it will target one IP address, which means by the very nature of things, it's only gonna target one interface. We wanna control which interfaces we're activating a routing process on. So by choosing the IP, the actual IP address of the interface, using a wildcard mask of all zeros, that will activate one and only one interface and leaves me in control of things. So given this is the first router, I'm not going to see a whole lot of activity. In fact, I should see zero activity as I bring activations up. And I'm actually going to activate, by the way, um, this backend network 10.1.0.0, .0 .0, actually one. So that that big green cloud in the, in the top left. So, um, for now, this is it for router one. I've, I've done passive interface default. I've disabled passive interface on the interfaces that will have EIGRP neighbors. And I've activated the three interfaces that we see connecting into router one. All right. So I see it looks good, looks good, looks good. Okay, good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad it's, uh, I'm glad it's coming through all right. It's hard to, it's hard to make a drawing that everybody can see <laughs> for, while we're configuring and make the, text is, you know, that big too. Um, all right. So anyways, um, on to router two. So let's go to router two and same thing. We're going to do a config T router EIGRP 100. Remember that has to match uh, passive interface default. We can start to abbreviate this to be a little faster. No passive int. And we got what gig one zero. We've got gig two zero and then network statements. So let's do network. Let's do the network towards router one and make sure that everything is working like we think it will be. So the reminder that the IP address belonging to the router will always be its router ID. So every link on router two will end with that too. I'll try to keep it intuitive. So that 10.12.0.0 that we see at the top, dot two for router two, we'll hit enter. We should see an EIGRP neighbor come up and we do. Very good. So we've established a neighbor. Um, good stuff if we do a show IP EIGRP neighbor. We'll see it there in the list and life is looking good. All right. Very good. So, um, let's go and activate the other interfaces. Let's do a network statement on 10.24.0.2. That should get our connection to router four with all zeros and the backend network 
which again would end with that too. So we should be good there. Um, oh, the serial interface, almost forgot that. So no passive interface, serial three slash two. And network on that is 10.12.0. I think I put a typo in there. That should be 23. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, I forgot this subnet originally on the drawing and I scrambled like literally five minutes before this thing started and I pulled it up and I copied and I pasted it down and I changed the color and I forgot to change the subnet. So yeah, that should definitely be 10.23.0.2. Oh, well, best laid plans. All right. Um, one other thing I want to have some fun with. Um, we, we touched on authentication last week with OSPF. So this is definitely not a CCNA concept. I mean, maybe the concept of authentication, but configuring authentication in EIGRP is a little more cumbersome than it was in OSPF, unfortunately. So we have this concept of a keychain. A, a keychain is effectively a list of authentication keys. And I can use, you know, once I establish a keychain, and maybe I have multiple keys. So think passwords. A key is a password. So I've got multiple passwords in this keychain, and then I can have keys come and go. I could actually configure them to expire eventually. So I could I could put a keychain, keep you know very similar keychains. They need to be the same keychains on all my routers that actually progressively expire keys over time. So it's a little more secure. It's a little more fun that way, but it's also a little more cumbersome. So we've got to think through what that looks like, and we'll just go ahead and walk through this example here. Let's make let's add authentication between routers two and four. Okay, so before we even touch EIGRP configuration, we have to configure that keychain. So we'll do keychain, we'll just call it EIGRP key. Yeah, that sounds about right. All right. Um, so then we need to specify what key number we're going to create, and you know, again, we can whatever the identifier is here. We've got. I, I don't know really quickly what is that how many bits is that I, I don't even know <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a lot of bits so we'll just say key one keep it simple and then key dash string this would be the identifier so our um, not our identifier our password so um, we're going to activate by the way MD5 authentication on EIGRP remember OSPF has like the they, they have the three types they have the type zero which is no authentication type one which is simple i.e. plain text, and type two, which is MD5. Well, EIGRP also has no authentication. That's the default. That's what we've been doing so far. And it skips right up to type two. Um, not that they call it type two in EIGRP, but it skips right up to an MD5. So there is no plain text authentication in EIGRP, which is nice. So let's just call this, I don't know, EIGRP. I already called the keychain EIGRP. I don't feel like I should. We'll say EIGRP pass. How about that? All right. We're not going to configure expiration or anything like that. Okay, so we've configured our keychain now. And by the way, keychains are used by more than EIGRP. Um, we, we can use keychains for, well, I don't know. I mean, e <laughs> um, trying to think of what else uses keychains. Uh, there's, there's a lot that uses it, and I'm blanking. So you know, chime into the chat if you know something that, that uses keychains. All right, so in the meantime, we have to get onto the interface that we're going to apply authentication to. And one thing to keep in mind with distance vector protocols, distance vector, there's a lot that can be done on a per interface basis. Summarization, we're gonna look at summarization later and that goes on the interface. And that's because as again, I've stressed a few times, EIGRP and distance vector is routing by rumor. It's literally, I'm trusting what you're telling me. If I'm your neighbor and you tell me something, I believe you 100%. And I have no way of validating it. So I can lie to you and you can lie to me, <laughs> which is what summarization is, right? I mean, summarization is saying I've got five routes behind me. Um, I'm not going to tell you I have five routes behind me. I'm going to tell you I have one route behind me and you're going to believe me. Uh, and that's why we can't do that with, e with OSPF because OSPF hears, so to speak, it's probably not the best analogy, but it's like I'm hearing things from everybody and everybody has to agree. And if nobody, if, if two people are telling me two different things, the database breaks and OSPF breaks. It's relying on everybody having the exact same view of the network. Well, with EIGRP and distance vector, there is no view of the network. There is simply, I'm connected to you, we're neighbors, and whatever you tell me is, not, is what I'm going to believe. So again, that's why we can summarize. So a lot of times, there's a lot of configuration on interfaces. And what I want to show you here, let's get onto gig 
Let's do an EIGRP authentication between what I say, routers two and four, so that would be gig one zero. And this is interesting, watch. You'd think the command for anything EIGRP would be IP EIGRP. Like remember IP OSPF was on the interface command, you know, for, for enabling OSPF on an interface. So you'd think IP EIGRP, except there is no IP EIGRP command. Um, and Cisco had two probably bad choices uh, or, or bad um, options available to them. One was to put everything behind EIGRP and then duplicate that with RIP because RIP is a distance vector protocol and you've got all of these interface, you know, summarizations and um, split horizon and authentication and all kinds of things that are interface level. And they could have put all of that behind EIGRP and duplicated it for RIP and put it all behind like IP RIP. And instead what they chose was to say, well, we're going to say IP authentication. And then you do the question mark. Well, actually, sorry, let's specify the keychain first. Keychain, what do I say? EIGRP key. Keychain. What are we doing here? Oh, there it is. <laughs> all right. So EIGRP. Now, there isn't even a RIP option for MD5 authentication, which is why it doesn't show up there. But, um, well, I don't know. Maybe there, whoops, that's right. I can't control W with this lab environment. All right, let's do authentication mode, EIGRP. All right, there was, I thought, no, I thought you could activate that viewer. I guess there isn't uh, MD5 on RIP, which sounds familiar. I just, there was something I did earlier that showed, had RIP, you know, IP, um, Let's just do split horizon, for example. So if I wanted to do activate split horizon on this interface, why isn't RIP showing up? Oh, it's because I don't have router RIP enabled? Hmm. I'm confused by that. I, I swear earlier I had RIP on there. So maybe maybe I'm just crazy. But either way, <laughs> the the I, I've totally lost control of, the, of what I'm trying to say. Uh, the, the commands for EIGRP don't start with IP EIGRP. That's what I was trying to get at and my example fell apart. So, ch so check it out. We got to do IP authentication. And then we saw two different things there. We saw keychain and then EIGRP. And then we specify the autonomous system number. And then we specify the name of the keychain, which was EIGRP key. Okay. Not the password, the keychain name. And then I activate it by saying IP authentication mode. And then we do EIGRP 100 md5 because that's the and, and that by the way just to show the question mark is our only option we, we can only enable md5 authentication so md5 now we have enabled authentication for eigrp on this interface all right we'll do it again because we have to do it again on router 4 in order to bring up that connection so let's eh, let's skip router 3 let's just go to router 4 and we're gonna say what do we got here all right so we've got to do everything so config t router EIGRP 100, passive interface default, because we're gonna do it the right way. No passive interface on gig 2.0 and fast ethernet 4.1. And we don't have a serial interface. Now we just gotta activate the networks. 10.24.0.4, that would be to router two. That, that should not actually create a neighborship because we know router two is waiting for an authentication um, enabled and an authentication enabled hello and we don't we don't actually see that it's coming up so that's exactly what we'd expect we'll get to the authentication in a moment we'll activate 10.34.0.4 and we'll activate 10.4.0.4 back in network okay so let's get that keychain created we'll do keychain eigrp whoops key this name could be different. Let's just call this key key two because it's a locally significant value. We'll just go ahead and show that. Key one, key dash string. Now this has to be the same, right? We had GRP pass is what we had said. Now we'll get onto that interface, gig two zero, and do an IP authentication. Um, and then keychain, EIGRP 100. And now we specify EIGRP key. And when we hit enter, it should come up. It should come up. Oh, forgot one step. IP authentication <laughs> uh, mode. We gotta we gotta actually enable it. So the keychain is on the interface, but the, we haven't actually enabled authentication. Um, so EIGRP one hundred MD five there. 
That's what I get for uh, sticking my neck out there. All right. Um, now it should come up. Interface 2, gig 2, 0. I activated it. I did a no passive interface. Did I get the right IP address? All right. Let's take a look here. <laughs> Okay, it's EIGRP pass. RP pass. I want to make sure I got the same password. Oh, somebody's probably no. Okay, um, that's my problem right there. I, I threw myself off with the two. So let's do this command again, but add the actual two. Eh? Now? All right, there we go. <laughs> uh, real life. All right, so authentication is there. So it wasn't smooth, but hey, again, we got the job done. Again, two commands. We have to, well, I shouldn't even say that. The first step is to create the keychain. Then we get onto the interface, then there's two commands. We have to enable the keychain itself and hopefully type in the right name for the keychain. And then second of all, we have to enable the mode, okay? All right, so next, router three. Config T, almost done with the boring stuff. Although the authentication was actually pretty interesting. No, uh, oh wait, passive int default. No passive int gig one slash zero. No passive int zero. Um, oh, we're gonna do the serial as well. And now let's get those network commands in there. So network 10.13.0.3. We should see all of these neighborships come up as we type these in, 10 dot, uh, whoops, that's my typo again, 23.3, all zeros. Is everybody clear on why we're doing all zeros? If you're not clear, then please raise your hand in some form in the chat. I wanna make sure that we're all good with that. The wildcard mask that's targeting a specific IP address. And then we're gonna enable that backend network, 10.3.0.4. Oh no, I did four, I wasn't paying attention. Three, and now network 10.3.0.3. All right, and we'll go ahead and get rid of the bad network statement that I put in there. All right, do show run. By the way, if you aren't aware of using the pipe section command in routers, it's really powerful. You do section or sec or whatever you wanna abbreviate section router, it'll give you not just the line router, which is good, not really, because what I really want is the whole section. And it gives, it really does give you that whole section, which is nice. So we've got the four network statements, we've got the three no passive interfaces, and we should see that we have three neighbors, and we do, okay. Well, I think our EIGRP topology is established at this point. So let's go ahead and have some fun taking a look around at things. By the way, um, I had my notes, but there's probably not much point in demoing it. So, you know, last week we demoed router IDs. So just keep in mind, router ID concept is the same within EIGRP. Um, it, it's it's not like it's interesting because OSPF, the OSPF database, relies heavily on that router ID. I mean, EIGRP does as well, but generally speaking, it follows the same path for configuring that router ID. And you can always, oops, where are we? Oh, that's funny. All right, I don't know what's going on here. I, uh, all right, I'm just gonna leave it alone. <laughs> um, all right, duh, what was I gonna show? Uh, do, oh yeah, yeah, router ID. Router ID, isn't it not? Oh, I don't know, maybe it's not. All right, well, we won't worry about it. That's what I get for going off script. Um, Big Papa, I'm liking the authentication stuff. I'm having a lot of issues with buffering. I'm good with the zeros. Okay, good. You're having issues with the video buffering? Like uh, like the actual stream is, is buffering, that's no good. I need to get a um, hard wire port pulled to my office. I've got a wireless access point right there, but you know how those mesh access points work. It's still doing a hop to get back to the main base. So, um, all right, so hopefully, hopefully the video is settling out here. Uh, all right, so. Yeah, I think that's, oh, I know. I think I know what's going on here. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to get to my notes. My notes are all messed up for some reason, but I, I think we're good here. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in 
<laughs> Just keep hitting play. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> as, if anybody else is having issues, let me know. Um, Cause I'd like to know if that's on my end, obviously I want to make sure that the stream is good quality. All right. So let's talk about the topology table. So I've mentioned OSPF database already quite a few times for it being an EIGRP um, stream. <laughs> the, the, you always have the, um, you know, the information that the routing pro protocol, the routing process has under the hood. So OSPF has the OSPF database and the, um, the route, the, I'm sorry, EIGRP has the topology table. So we're going to pull that up here and we'll just pick router three. Why not? It doesn't really matter at this point. Show IP uh, EIGRP topology. Okay. So the topology is going to show us what's happening underneath the hood. Um, before we even drill into this, if I were just do a show IP route EIGRP, just to clear out all the non EIGRP routes, um, we see EIGRP is repre represented by a D. We do need to know that if you're studying for your CCNA. Um, administrative distance, same thing, um, we know is 90. Here's this metric, and again, we can see that the metric is already not nearly as clean as OSPF. Most OSPF costs, they call it a cost, um, was in like the maybe 10 to 100 range. I mean, they were, they were realistic values, and this, these are pretty values because we're using gig and gig ethernet is pretty fast and so it keeps the metric ID down. But it's not uncommon to see six or seven figures in this metric uh, calculation. So uh, we'll, we'll get to the metric, how the metric is calculated after we talk about the topology table. So EIGRP has, let's, let's go and pull that topology table back up. Nate, things are good on your end. Thanks for confirming. All right. Um, Let's look at this topology table. So when we're looking at this, at this, what what this is really doing is collecting all of the route information and storing what I need to know, even if I don't install routes into the routing table. For example, if I were to go to the routing table, call it, and enter a static route, so I say, okay, well, the route to this network, well, I'm on router three, that's a bad example, right here. The route to this network here, which is the network between routers two and four, I'm just gonna enter a static route. Well, I could go enter a static route and that would be fine. And, and that would override EIGRP because the default administrative distance for a static route is one. So assuming I left the default, it's less than 90, it's going to override what EIGRP has. But that doesn't pull the route out of the EIGRP table. EIGRP needs this because what happens if that static route goes away? Maybe I have that static route tied to a condition that it you know it goes away or what have you. And um, or, or, hey, maybe uh, I just go and I delete the static route. And so now we actually could use that route in the routing table. And so the router is constantly looking to make sure that the routing table is built like it should be built based on all the information. This is why, by the way, we have route, like, like my routers could be running EIGRP and OSPF at the same time. In fact, Cisco on some level, especially if you go towards the CCIE level, we talk about route redistribution. We need to understand what that concept is, even at the even at the CCNA level, honestly. Um, taking routes from OSPF and advertising them into EIGRP and vice versa. So that's route redistribution. But if I have a router that's simply running EIGRP and OSPF, how do I choose which routes to use? I mean, we, we understand the administrative distance concept. If I learn OSPF routes and EIGRP routes by default, 90 is less than 110, and so I'm going to install EIGRP routes. But I've still got all of that information OSPF because what happens if my EIGRP link goes down? Well, then I'm going to need to rely on that OSPF information to populate the routing table. Uh, Big Pop, I'm sorry, did I miss something regarding the reference bandwidth there? <laughs> um, yeah, right, with the uh, with OSPF. Uh, yeah, that was the trap that we laid last week, right? Uh, it's not even a trap. It's it's just the default that OSPF defaults to 100 meg being the maximum link that's considered. Which interestingly enough, by the way, EIGRP is 10 gig, and I need to look up and see if there's a way to change that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, but yeah, EIGRP basically uses the same concept as reference bandwidth, except it starts with 10 gig instead of 100 meg, which is good. That's better, but I mean we're already over 100 gig, so you'd think that we'd um, we'd want to fix that. Whew. Okay. So, um, assuming we leave aside the metric calculation, again, we're going to come back to this. Let's just take, take these metrics, uh, these values at, at face value at this point. So this router right here is learning 
these the this route right here 10.24.0.0 via three neighbors now keep in mind the router three and router four in our diagram down below they're the ones in the corners that have three connections so they're actually connected to all three routers this is why we can have three connections on on this so we actually see router one is advertising that network router four is advertising that network router two is advertising that network and they're all advertising it with very different um, metrics so this is what we call we, we take a look at the second number right here you, you'll notice that there's always a higher number followed by a lower number this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated with the IGRP, and this is CCNP stuff, okay? So when we're when we're talking, understanding what's going on in the topology table, we need to understand this concept of reported distance, or RD, and feasible distance, FD, okay? So we see FD right here is listed for the entire route, so one time, it says the feasible distance is 3328, and we should see that that matches one of the FDs listed, and we do, it's right here. It's the route via router one. So if I were to do a show IP route, let's just do a show IP route EIGRP again. 10.24.0.0 is via router one. Okay. And now we know why, because if we scroll back to this topology table right here, oops, I scrolled a little too far. Yeah, let's just pull it back up this way. Okay. So this route right here, the lowest, um, way for me to get there is via router one right here 3328 is my ability to get there that's what the feasible distance is if i'm looking at the feasible distance it's me saying okay if i were to send it to router one the metric would be 3328 if i were to send it to router four my metric would be 28416 and if i were to send it to router two holy smokes um, it would be, again, remember I mentioned seven digit numbers. That's a seven digit number. That's 2.1 million. It would be 2.1 million for me to send it to router three. So what's going on here? Well, two things. First of all, this reported distance concept happens first. What happens is all of these routers at first tell router, this is router three. So they tell router three, this is how far it is, how far away I am from this network. Okay. That's the reported distance. So router one says that I am 3072 away from this network. Okay. Router four says that I'm 2816 away from this network. And by the way, router two says the same thing, which makes sense because router two and router routers two and four, they're actually connected to that network. We know that if we look at the diagram, right? Routers two and four are on the edges of 10.24. So you'd think that they would be the best way to get there. Um, kind of odd that we're not choosing either one of those for our connection, but there's a good reason for that. So yeah, I mean, they're, they are actually saying that they can get there better than router one. And that's what we'd expect. Router one should be further away from that network than routers two and four. So why are we sending it to router one? Well, that's where the feasible distance comes into play. The feasible distance is me saying, okay, I've got 3072 is what router one is telling me, but my way, my best path to router one is somewhere in the vicinity of 256 or so. Okay. So I can get to router one in 256 router one can get there in 3072. So if I'm five miles away from router one and router one is 10 miles away, how far away am I? Well, I'm five plus 10, I'm 15 miles away. Exact same thing here. If router one's uh, reported distance is 3000 and my ability to get to you is 256, then my feasible distance, the distance for me to get to this network via router one is, well, in this case, 3328. Okay. Big Papa, I've heard the reported distance also called advertised distance. Yes, it, it could be the same thing. Uh, it took me a minute to see they were the same number. Sorry about that. And, or, or maybe you're saying that, um, in your studies earlier, you were seeing that as well. Um, yeah, I actually originally learned it as advertised distance. I, I think one reason why potentially we like to go with reported distance is because administrative distance is also a thing. And so we, especially within the world of routing protocols. And so if we had administrative distance and advertised distance and they're both AD and they both end with distance, then, you know, it's just one more thing to get confused about. So, um, but either way, you, you should be aware that they, they could be either one. Uh, either way, it's, it's the same thing, right? They're advertising it to me or they're reporting to me their distance. 
Okay, so in our network, this is where things get interesting because routers two again and uh, two and four, they're actually telling me that they're closer to the network. And yet when I add my distance to them, check out what happens. This, it goes from basically 2,800 to 28,000. So I don't know, um, minus 816, that would be 27,600. Um, 27,600 minus 2,800. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's roughly probably 25,000 away at this point. So if I'm roughly 25,000 away, what's going on? Why am I 25,000 away? Well, look at the topology. That is a fast ethernet link. And a fast ethernet link is one tenth the uh, bandwidth of a gig. And so my distance to, you know, from router three to router four is like 25,000. So I'm going to add my 25,000. I'm going to add it to the, um, to the, what, what's being advertised, the reported, right? The 20, 2816. So I add those two numbers together and I get this 28,416. So that is my distance to get to that network via router four. And we're going to do the exact same thing. Why in the world is this such a bad number? Because it's across a serial link. And that's probably a 1.5 meg serial link. And the, the cost of the metric on that is going to be atrocious. The bandwidth is low. The delay is actually really high on that link. And so, you know, 2.1 million. That's where we get that from. So at this point, this is this is pittance. This, is that even 1%? I mean, I add the 2116 to whatever, you know, 2.17 million. And I basically get 2.17 million. And it was maybe 2.16 to 2.17. Uh, Bibi Tayo, can you explain the AD again? Okay, sorry about that. I did uh, gloss over that. So, um, and I'm not sure which AD you mean. <laughs> we have two ADs. Um, we have administrative distance. Administrative distance is this concept of I might run five different routing protocols and all five of those routing protocols across different links, links usually, all five of those routing protocols might tell me that they can get to a network and I need to know which routing protocol I trust more. And so administrative distance is a ranking system. And it's one of these things where the lower the administrative distance is actually the better. And so we trust EIGRP more than OSPF. And the primary reason we trust EIGRP more than OSPF on a Cisco router is because Cisco invented EIGRP and that's all there is to it. <laughs> so EIGRP has an administrative distance of 90. OSPF has an administrative distance of 110. And so that's 180. The other AD would be this right here. I call it reporting or reported distance or RD. Um, advertised distance or AD is another way of saying it, but it's what my router neighborships, my, my neighbors, this is what they are telling me is their distance to the um, network in question. In this case, this network 10.24.0.0 slash 24. The advertised distance reported distance, okay. So let's be let's be really clear on this. Um, actually, I might let me just uh, let me just do a quick drawing. I think that'll probably be best if I switch over to. Um, you'd think I'd have this down by now. Let's see here. Oh, it's called. Is it this? Nope. Huh? What happened to my? I lost my button for uh, switching over to. There we go. Hmm. My stream deck is out of date. I don't know what happened there. All right, so let's just draw this out real quick, okay? So I have, uh, give me a brush. Oh, it's doing its thing again, hang on. I think, I think it actually glitches out and I don't know how to fix this where y'all can't even see what I'm drawing because I don't even know why. All right, so if I, let me delete this. Delete this. Can I draw on this one? Okay, I can draw on this one. Hmm. I don't know why. All right, there we go. I'm not on my chalk, so it looks weird to draw this on a chalkboard. But all right, so I let's say this is my router. This happens to be router three. This is the one we've been talking about, right? Um, oh, uh, real quick, Big Papa. Different books call it different names with the same number. Reported distance. Makes more sense to avoid confusion with administrative distance. Yeah, thank you. That just in summary, that's what I was trying to uh, explain earlier. But I want to be clear on this concept, okay? So if I've got a router up here with some connection, and maybe it's through other routers, it doesn't really matter. 
but some connection to a network. Let's say this is network A over here, okay? And what's gonna happen is these routers are talking and let's just assign metrics to these that are easy for us to see. And for, okay, let's say that this is a metric of 100. Let's say this is a metric of 200. Let's say this is a metric of 100 here, okay? So this router is gonna advertise to that router that hey, I can get there in 100. Um, this router here is going to add 100 and 200 and say I can get here in 300, okay? Again, think of this like cities and miles. You know, if, if I have three cities in, you know, sequentially in order and I've got to drive 100 miles to get to the next city and then 200 miles and then 100 miles to get to my destination, it's going to be 400, right? I mean, we, we do this all the time. Um, but this is the reported distance, we'll call it. And so the reported distance is going to be still stored in the topology table. And there's a reason for this. We've got to keep track of both of these numbers independently. So the router three is going to say, okay, for network A, we're going to write this down as saying that I can get there in 400. This is the feasible distance. Again, this is, again, it's weird that they picked the word feasible, but hey, it is what it is. The feasible distance is 400 and the RD or AD, whatever we want to call it, the reported distance is 300. Okay. The reported distance is important because let's, let's do another quick example here. Let me erase this right here. I wanted to cover this and now's a good time to cover it. EIGRP and loop prevention. Okay. Oh, it's doing it again. Hmm. Why would it be doing that? Man. All right. Well, I guess I get one layer tonight. Every now and again, it just bugs out and doesn't give me multiple layers. Okay. So we're going to have, let's, let's say we have another router here and another router over here. And this is a weird network. I get that. Totally agree. It's a weird network. I don't know what's going on with this. All right. Router three. Oh, there we go. This is still router three here. Okay. Um, so what am I going to do? I've got this route to A. Now it's in my routing table. I've installed it in my routing table. I'm going to advertise A out to these neighbors. And they're going to eventually cycle this back around and tell me that they have a path to network A. This is the nature of distance vector protocols. Again, routing by rumor, right? I mean, does, I don't know what this is. Let's say router seven. Does router seven have a path to network A? Yes. Does it go through router three? Yes. That's a loop. That's not good. Um, so why is router seven telling router three that it has a path to A? Because router seven doesn't know that it goes through router three. Again, distance vector, I have my corner of the world and that is it. Now, yes, router three would be advertising to router seven that it also has a path to A, but it doesn't, that doesn't mean that I don't get an advertisement back from router seven because router seven will eventually um, in all likelihood have an opportunity to tell me that it has a path to router A or to network A. Um, Big Papa, fast convergence with the feasible successor already in the routing table or topology table. Yes, and we'll get to that in a, here in a moment. So loop prevention first. We'll get to, we'll, we'll start with, we're gonna start with loop prevention, which is a big deal within the, EIGRP topology table, and then we're going to get to feasible successors, okay? Um, which does enable fast convergence. Big Papa's right about that. So um, how do we prevent this from happening? Well, the way we prevent this from, or, or from looping, I should say, like what, what if router three trusted um, router seven? What if router three happened to lose this connection right here, just at the very moment that router seven advertises that it's got a route to A? You know, now all of a sudden we have this network loop problem um, or what have you. So, so whatever the scenario is, okay, router seven has uh, advertised to router three that it's, it's, um, it's got a path to A. Let's just make all of these 100 to keep it simple. 100, 100, 100. So what is router seven telling router three that its distance is? Well, router three told this router here that it's, able to get there in 400, right? It's reporting its feasible distance. So router, we'll just call this router six. So router six advertises to router seven that I can get to A and I can get to it in, well, we add the hundred. So it's, well, I can get to it in 500. 
So router seven is going to advertise it to router three and say that I can get there in 600. Well, there is a potential. We look at, we, here's the good news. Like we look at this and we know that there's a loop. The network doesn't know that there's a loop because it doesn't have a picture of this. Again, OSPF effectively gives the routers a picture of the topology and EIGRP can't tell what the topology is. It's just trusting what people are telling it. So what it does is it compares this number 600 to its own feasible distance. Okay. If an advertised route comes in and it's greater than my feasible distance to get to this route to the same network, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to drop it. Now we know that there's a loop in this case. There could not be a loop. We could have a route down here that comes up this way and it's like 700 to get there. Maybe it's a backup serial link. And so he's legitimately telling router three that, hey, I have a path to A and it costs, I guess, technically 800. And router three has no way of knowing whether there's a loop there or whether there's not. And, you know, the this you know scenario up in the upper left, that is a loop. We understand that that's somebody coming back to router three and telling them that I've got a path to A, even though it goes through router three. But the bottom right situation is different. That just has a slower link. But we have to treat them, you know, both scenarios the exact same. And so if our reported distance coming in is greater then my feasible distance, then I'm simply, I'm not going to store it in my topology table. I'm going to ignore it. Okay. That is the result of, um, we call it dual, you know, the diffusing, uh, algorithm, uh, diffusing update, diffusing update algorithm, I think D U A L. Um, it's, the, it's this algorithm that it's, it's using to effectively make sure that there's a loop free topology. Um, with ethernet, we, um, by and large, we, we can't control whether there's loops. That's why we have spanning tree. You know, like Ethernet doesn't do anything to recognize that there's been a loop. Routing protocols, though, we don't want to, we don't block links like we do with spanning tree. We're, we rely on the networking protocols to to figure out what a loop-free topology looks like and make it loop-free. OSPF and EIGRP both guarantee a loop-free topology, and this is how EIGRP does that. All right. Um, the good news with loops in a layer three, by the way, is that a layer three loop, we rely on that TTL, that time to live. Uh, and so at least within the IP world, if a packet goes around and around and around and around forever, then uh, eventually it's going to die just because we're decrementing that time to live. And once the time to live reaches zero, the, the packet dies. But with layer two, we don't get that, which is why we're pretty desperate for spanning tree, um, unfortunately. Okay. Um, any questions on this? I'm not seeing anything come in. So let me know if, uh, if you've got any questions about the loop free part of this topology. Okay. Um, let's go back to, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back here. Okay. Oh, there's my button. Okay. Um, I need to get the, uh, I guess it was there the whole time. <laughs> go figure. Okay, you all got that back up. That looks good. Okay, so let's take a look at... Okay, now I need to pull up. There we go. No! Oh. Lost my session. There we go. All right, so now we need to talk about this concept of feasible successor, okay? Given the previous example where that bottom in the bottom right where we had this really bad cost come in and we thought there might be a loop, right? I mean, there, there could be a loop that way. So we don't install that into our topology table. We don't have a fast backup path. If, if we can prove that, yes, you have a worse, you have a, you have a bad path, a bad cost, but, but if, if it's impossible for there to be a loop there, then in the event of an outage going to this network, then I could send my traffic that way instantly because I can trust that there wasn't a loop there. I'm not going with you because you're a worse path, but you're still a valid path. Does that make sense? So maybe we should just flip back and take a look at that. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. Um, 
So if I pull that real quick back up, let's say, for example, that, let's choose a different color here. Let's say that this path right here isn't 700. Oh, that's kind of cool. I like the blurring thing that's going on there, whatever that is all about. Um, oops, it can't be that low. Um, 300, 150, yeah. Let's call this 150, that should work. 250, 300, 200, 300, 400, yeah, okay. So we'll call this 150. So now this router down here is telling our big router right here, oh, router three, yeah, I forgot, we didn't name it. So it's telling router three that my distance to get there is 100 plus 150, it's 250. Darn it, that didn't work. We need this to be 250. Does that work? 350, 400, yes, that works. Okay, sorry, bad math. So 100 and 250 is 350. So I'm going to, whoops, that's still 250. I'm going to say that I can get there now in 350. All right, so now I'm getting two advertisements. I'm getting 300 and I'm getting 350. So we know which one is going to pick. It's going to still pick the same path. Say, okay, I'm gonna go this way to get to network A because 300 is better than 350, makes sense. Um, by the way, in both cases, I'm assuming that this is 100. So really it's looking at my feasible distance and my feasible distance is 400, right? So let's just write this down. I know it's getting a little busy. Feasible distance is 400 to get to path A. But interestingly enough, your advertised distance is 350. 350 happens to be less than 400. So what's, remember what our loop prevention mechanism is? Our loop prevention mechanism is saying that if this number right here, 400, um, I'm sorry, if this number right here coming in is larger than my path to get there, then you might be using me to get there. Does that make sense? So if you're telling me 450, for all I know, I'm telling you 400 um, and you're able to get, you know, your, your, your link to me is 50. So you're thinking, oh, I can get there. I can get there in 450. So there's a, there's somehow a loop in this process. It's probably not a direct loop back and forth. There's usually another router in the path, but you get the point, right? Like if, if I'm getting there in 400 and you're getting there in more than 400, you might be using me to get there. And that's a risk of a loop. But, but if I'm getting there in 400 and you're getting there in 350, then you're guaranteed not using me. You're guaranteed not to be using me. So there is no risk of a loop. I can trust that you're valid. You're not my best path. My best path is through A or through whatever this router is at the top here. This isn't A, this is, I don't know, router 10. I'm just throwing random numbers out there. My best path is through router 10, but I know that you're good. And so I'm going to call you a feasible successor. That show up? No, close enough. Feasible successor. There we go. All right, good. So a feasible successor in the event of an outage, in the event that this link goes down right here, and I am desperate for a route to get to back get to A, I'm going to check my topology table and find out were there any other offers? Okay? It's it's kind of like this, I don't know, I don't, analogy jumped into my head for whatever reason of like losing out on the thing you really wanted and so you go and you check to see if your backup option is still there, right? I mean, that's effectively what we're doing here. So the, this link goes down, you go to your backup, oh, you go to your topology table, say, oh, I have a feasible successor. And instantly I swing over to my feasible successor, okay? EIGRP has a lengthy process of querying. If I, if, you know, if that link goes down, and I'm, I've lost my route. I'm going to query my neighbors to try to figure out if anybody else has this route. It, it puts the route into active mode. You'll study this as part of your, I think it's part of CCNA. If, if not, as part of your Encore, you'll, you'll cover this. That's a very slow process. Okay. The fastest way to converge is if I swing over to a feasible successor. Nate, time to go to small group. Hey, thanks for always joining us before you got to run off on um, Tuesday nights. So say, take care. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so um, hopefully that made sense. Again, what we're really what we're really focusing here on is the fact that 
or is a failover scenario. All right, so now let's go back to the lab on demand. And we're going to take a look at the fact that we have feasible successors. So take a look at this. For this route, we actually have all of these routes stored, which is kind of cool. Okay. Um, this is my best path. Okay. My feasible distance is this 3328. And if I'm going to go out towards router one, this is how I get there. Um, uh, I'm sorry. This is my path, my cost to get here. But look at this. Look at these reported distances. These reported distances of 2816 are less than my feasible distance. Because they're less than my feasible distance, I know that they're not using me to get there. Again, we can look at this. Oops, I didn't put the uh, the map up. Let me get that put back up. There we go. All right, so <laughs> we can look at this map and say, okay, yeah, I, I know you're not getting there. They're literally directly attached. But Keep in mind, EIGRP, we're trusting what people are saying. We can't make the assumption uh, of any of that. So yeah, 2816. Now, if this if this happened to be higher than 3328 for whatever reason, um, these entries would not be here, okay? We would not have them. So when you look at some of these other paths, let's say uh, this right here. So this is that, um, oh, that's a slash 32. I don't know what's up with that. All right, so 10.3.0.0, that's that backend network behind, wait, I am router three. Why am I, okay, eh, let's look at here. Okay, finally found one. <laughs> so this is the backend route behind router one, or the backend, that green cloud in the top left, the backend network. So we've got this 10.1.0.0, it's via router one. Now, I have connections, I have neighborships with routers um, two and four. Routers two and four are telling me, guaranteed, they're telling me they have a path to 10.1.0.24. They do have a path. Uh, we, we look at the topology, right? Router four can get there via router two. Router two can get there via router one. And so they both have a path to this network. And yet I don't, I don't see them in the list. Why don't I see them in the list? like I do down here. I've got all three routers in this list. I've got all three routers in this list. Well, the reason for that is because when they advertise to router three, their, their path, like how fast they can get there, it's too long. This 2816, we've pretty well established is about the lowest number on here. If my distance, if my ability to get there is, I, I did the wrong thing, Never mind. There it is, 30, 3072. So still pretty low. So if, yeah, if either of those guys could get to this network in 2816, we'd have, a, we'd have that in there, right? The only way you can get there in 2816 is router one because router one is directly attached and 2816 is um, on some level the, uh, the, the gig metric, right? So the fact that I can get there in 3072 is me adding my, um, my uh, links metric to it. Uh, 256 again, it looks like, give or take. Uh, I don't think that's give or take. I think that's I think that's exactly 256. So um, so I'm adding my 256 metric to it and hitting 3072. So this is my feasible distance. They're coming in and saying that they can get there in greater than 3072. If we wanted to see, let, let's let's go take a look. So router two, we'll do a show IP eigrp topology table. And here's our network in question 10.1.0.0. So we can indeed get there from router two through router one, except my ability to get there is 3072. Okay, we can both get there. And if we look at the topology, it makes sense. Router two and router three are connected via gig connections to router one and router one has this network directly attached. So it's the exact same distance, but it's not less. So router two is telling router three, hey, I can get there in 3072. Incidentally, it's happening the other way around too, right? Like router three is telling router two, I can get there in 3072. But there's a chance, not a good one, but there's a chance that the link that you view, the, you know, the link between us is zero. And so if you think you're getting through here uh, to this network through me, well, that's, that's bad news. That's a loop, right? So I can't trust it. So that's why it doesn't show up in this list. So this is why feasible successors are, are better within the world of EIGRP is because I can very quickly flip over to them. If I lose this connection right here 
to um, you know to router one. If I lose my my neighbor connection, this my ability to get to this route is drastically impeded. It's going to be a slow process for me to get back. I'm gonna to have to send queries out to routers two and four and say, hey, can you get to this network still? And they will say yes. They'll both respond and I'll get to pick you know, between the two, which one's the better path. Um, but that's a much slower process than me simply redirecting my traffic. I mean, yeah, GRP can redirect that traffic in microseconds. Well, milliseconds really. Usually in that 100 millisecond range is what I've seen in real life um, to, to fling a route over from one link to another when you have a feasible successor. So if it takes, you know, if I have to go out and query, it might take seconds um, just just for how long it takes for the routers to process. The, and, and the other thing too that you'll learn in EIGRP is when you send all of your um, queries out, you can't do anything until you get all your queries back. So if one of those queries gets stuck for whatever reason, then it causes problems. So... Whew. Okay. So um, let's see what's next up on the agenda. Again, any questions, be sure to ask. Um, this whole concept of reported distance and feasible distance is very important, especially if you're going for the Encore. If you're at CCNP level and you're moving forward, make sure that you are studying this concept. But if you're CCNA level, then um, this is this is beyond CCNA don't freak out about this. <laughs> Mostly the configuration that we've done so far is, is primarily where you're going to need to, uh, to get to. Okay. So let's talk about metric. How in the world is metric, um, calculated? All right. Um, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to paste this in. Copy this. Let's go back to our, whoops. Um, let's just pull this up. All right. So, whoo, look at that beautiful thing. Okay. So, uh, we are a little bit, we're almost, actually, we are a little bit too big. So let me get, clean this up for y'all. Oops. I was going to write this out, but I just figure it's probably easier to, uh, see it if it's just in text format. Because this is kind of a nasty algorithm in case you haven't noticed yet. All right, make this clean so we can talk about it. Okay, so this is, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's not great, okay? I'm not gonna lie. Um, you don't usually have to memorize this for any exam that I've ever seen. I've never been asked, you know, which is the right metric calculation um, so that's the good news. We don't have to memorize this um, algorithm. There are parts of this we need to understand. Okay, so let's walk through this. First of all, Cisco values four concepts within EIGRP um, metric calculation. Bandwidth, load, delay, and reliability. Okay, these are the four parameters that Cisco is going to use to evaluate a link and figure out what this metric value is. By the way, one thing you don't see on here is MTU. So, so there, I've seen things around where like MTU is calculated as part of this. It's bizarre because we actually have five constants. These K values, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, are constants that relate back to these concepts. And for whatever reason, we have two different constants that refer to reliability. Um, it, it, there, there's, there's kind of a vague reason for it, but um, either way, just the fact that um, we have five values. Sometimes we're like, oh, okay, bandwidth, load, delay, reliability, and something else. No, it's just four. We have five K values and four parameters, okay? So what we're looking at here is bandwidth, which is, okay, so yes, it's the bandwidth of the link, but when you configure this bandwidth parameter, it does not change the bandwidth of the link. So it's a kind of a one-way street, right? The, the bandwidth of the link can set the bandwidth value of an interface. But I've seen people go on to interfaces and be like bandwidth 40 meg or whatever on a hundred, like maybe you have a hundred meg link and you're trying to um, shrink it to like match what your service provider has or whatever. So you do a bandwidth 40. Um, that's actually good practice because EIGRP needs to see that link as a hundred meg or as, as 40 meg instead of a hundred but it doesn't actually change the bandwidth of the link. The link can only run at 100 meg. Um, we'll, 
short of traffic shaping QoS mechanisms and such, which we've covered in the past. But um, so, so bandwidth, it's going to look at the bandwidth value, not strictly speaking the bits per second on the link, but whatever we have configured on that link. The load is a, I'll call it a dynamic value. It, it depends on how busy the interface is, but we're going to come back to that word dynamic here in a little bit. Um, then we have delay. That would be how long it takes to, you know, send traffic across this link. So the faster the interface, the lower the delay typically. Serial links have notoriously bad delay. And reliability. So this would be like as packets get dropped on this interface or as discards or bad uh, frame check sequences, whatever. You know, as the link looks unstable, I'm going to drop this reliability. Okay. Whew. Then we take these K values um, and we decide how much weight effectively we want to give to them. Now, here's the good news in all of this. Um, these values are all by default, either one or zero. And the only ones that are even one are K1 and K3. By default, we set K2 to zero, which negates this whole part of us taking load into account. And K4 and K5 are zero. So that gets rid of this entire part right here. Okay. So K5 is, is zero now. So there you go. Um, although what's interesting about this is that, <laughs> um, and this is true, even though it multiplies this by, if, if truly, if, if K5 is set to zero, the way Cisco made this, like the entire thing would be equal zero because 256 times a bunch of whatever times zero. Well, anything times anything times zero is zero. So um, for whatever reason, they actually have it as an exception that if K5 is equal to zero, which by default it is, that this entire thing equates to a one. I don't think they could have come up with a better workaround than that, but nah, it is what it is. So what what that means is since K1 is, is or I'm sorry, K1 and K3 are both one, that means Cisco cares about bandwidth and delay. Because K2, K4, and K5 are zero, that means they don't care about load and reliability. Why don't they care about load and reliability? I mean, I wasn't there when Cisco designed EIGRP, but there are a couple of reasons that are circulated for this. Um, one of which is that all of these values are statically determined once the link comes online. So EIGRP doesn't send, like, you know how RIP, I don't know if you've studied RIP yet, but RIP sends updates every 30 seconds. And so every 30 seconds is sending an update. EIGRP doesn't work that way. EIGRP is only going to send an update if it needs to send an update. Otherwise, Life is good. Carry on. What I told you hasn't changed. There's no reason for me to send an update. So if if these values, load and reliability, are constantly changing based on the actual load, based on the actual reliability, it doesn't actually help um, because I can't really recalculate. I would be going into my topology table and constantly changing values, and we don't want to do that. So anytime I get an update, on that link, I'm going to look at the load and reliability and figure out what it is at that moment in time. And it's sort of a snapshot. I learned this route when it came in, when the load was high and the reliability was low, and I insert it into my topology table. And it's going to be stuck that way until I get another update when maybe the load and reliability are different. So that's one reason. I That's probably the largest reason. And so the fact that K2, K4, and K5 start at zero makes sense. This is something you'll want to memorize. You'll want to memorize this. I mean, the the way to memorize this, honestly, is this. It's one, zero, one, zero, zero. Just remember that binary sequence. It's binary for 20. Um, we get 16 plus no eights plus four plus no twos plus no ones. So 16 plus four, it's, it's 20. So if you can remember that in some fashion, um, that's what I did when I was taking CCNP exams way back in the days. I memorized that 10100. Again, you don't have to memorize this. At least I've never experienced where you have to memorize the whole thing. So let's look at this algorithm by default. So if we're to take the default version, we would say 256 times, and then we have, let's do the brackets here for now. We might be able to simplify that. K1 times bandwidth plus K2 is a zero, so this whole thing is zero. K3 is a zero, so that whole thing is zero. 
Oh, I, I'm sorry. K <laughs> K3 is not zero. Don't, don't, don't just ignore what I just said. Uh, plus K3 times delay. Okay. And I missed a parentheses. There we go. Big Papa default values. That's important. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta know them. You gotta know them. Okay. So there we go. So, so this algorithm just got way simpler. Like the big compli complicated parts of, of it were load and reliability portion. So fortunately, it's simply a matter of, um, hey, K1. And, and again, let's, let's think about the defaults again. What are K1 and K3 by default? One. So since one times bandwidth is bandwidth and one times delay is delay, by default, we can even get rid of some of these parentheses. In it. Um, oh, that's right. This program is silly. It doesn't use delete, or at least it treats delete as if it's a backspace instead of delete. All right, so there we go. There's our algorithm. 256 times bandwidth plus delay. Okay? Bandwidth is in kilobits per second. Um, and technically, it's like an inverse. It's, this is, okay, let me just write this out. Bandwidth is, remember that reference bandwidth conversation? It's 10 to the 7, which is 10 gig, um, divided by the actual bandwidth of the link. Because, you know, if you think about it, the higher your bandwidth, with this if this algorithm is just straight up what we use, then the higher the bandwidth, the higher your metric. Well, we don't want the metric to go up as your bandwidth goes up. You want, as bandwidth goes up, your metric to go down. So we have to somehow inverse that value. And the way we inverse that value is we divide it into 10 to the seventh. So um, what's interesting about that is it does still technically work well. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to look at that. I, I have to think that that would, if your bandwidth is like 40 gig, I have to think at that point that it would, um, it would, it would go to, um, to one. It would just, it would just calculate out as a one, which is what 10 gig does. Anyways, uh, I haven't seen changing the EIGRP default uh, bandwidth, but guess what? Back when I was studying EIGRP in depth, 10 gig was a pipe dream. <laughs> Okay, so, um, oh yeah, all right, so there are two things I want to talk about here too. Bandwidth is the lowest bandwidth in the path, okay? What that means is if I've got 15 gig links through a bunch of routers, and then I've got a fast ethernet link to connect to the final destination, my lowest bandwidth in that path is 100 meg. And so my bandwidth calculation is based on 100 meg. It's always based on the lowest bandwidth. So the bandwidth is actually propagated throughout the advertising path as part of the um, as part of the EIGRP update. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have a clue what's downstream, right? So the lowest bandwidth in the path is the bandwidth that's used for calculation. The delay, however, is the sum of delays throughout the entire network. So when it comes to these two, which one do you want to tweak? The bandwidth or the delay? Big Papa, it's like OSPF looking at the difference between 100 meg and a gig. Yeah, exactly. It's the exact same situation. It's just off by a factor of two. Um, uh, is that right? Gig, yeah, 10 gig, gig, 100 meg. OSPF starts off with like 10 to the five and EIGRP toes 10 to the seven for whatever reason. So yay more, but couldn't they have just gone like 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 20? I don't know. I guess that would have made for larger... Um, larger metric calculation. So they're trying to find that balance, which is interesting. All right. So the question of which one you want to tweak, the one you want to tweak is the delay. The reason for that is I actually just hit this in this lab. I was messing around with this lab earlier and I tweaked the bandwidth, even though I know that you should tweak the delay because I just wasn't thinking. I went in there and was like, oh, I'm just going to change the bandwidth here and test something. And it didn't change. Nothing changed. Why didn't anything change? Because I tweaked the bandwidth except the bandwidth was the minimum in the path. And so the bandwidth I tweaked happened to not be the minimum in the path. So I took like, you know, this link bandwidth and I lowered it to here, even though this link out here was the lowest one in the path. So tweaking the bandwidth can do nothing, literally nothing, if I tweak the bandwidth. Tweaking the delay will always change the metric in the path because it, we add up all of the delay and that is, um, that is, that is what we use for our calculation. So when it comes to manipulation, metric manipulation, if you get equal path routes and you wanna choose one over the other, 
or maybe you've got a, I don't know, a 20 gig link somewhere, but you know that that's, I, I don't know, whatever the situation is, and you want to change the EIGRP metrics, well, this is where you can start to change the, um, the delay, and that's usually the right way to, to make changes in the network. Okay. Um, so I think, I think that's about uh, it for the metrics. Okay, um, if, if there's any questions um, about any of that, let me know. We're gonna do one more thing, and we're about right on schedule here. We're gonna switch back to the lab, and we're gonna take a look at summarization. All right, so summarization is what I have said a few times. This is, oh yeah, I've gotta get the, uh, hold up. There we go. Nope. There we go. All right, that looks good. So summarization is lying. <laughs> it really is truly saying, hey, um, I've got a bunch of routes, but I'm not telling you about those routes. I'm only telling you about this one. So why do we summarize? Well, we summarize because I might truly have 100 routes behind me. And I don't need to tell you about all 100 if I can summarize them into one block of addresses. You know, I mean, why? It, it, it would be the effectiveness of, you know, if, if you're, you've got a presentation to give me, it's 100 pages, and we meet up somewhere, and you're like, all right, here's the presentation. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven. And I'm like, can't you just give me the binder? You know, like, just give me the binder. I got to go you know, or whatever the situation is. So you give me the binder, that's that's the route summarization, right? It's like, okay, really, I've got all of these, why, why bother giving you all of the details when I can summarize this route? And so routing tables are not of infinite size. We don't usually brush up against the largest um, or the maxes of our routing table size, but we wanna be efficient. We want to um, do things well. And so we can summarize um, to, to help reduce routing table loads. It increases the speed of route table lookups. Um, so for large networks, this makes this makes sense. Uh, and it's a big deal. I will say this though, summarization is not something you typically go into a network and willy nilly just start summarizing. You need to have architected your network to be summarizable, for lack of better words. <laughs> um, if I have 15 sites all hanging off of one WAN router, let's say, and their networks are all over the place. Well, then I can't really summarize that. Not, not easily. Um, however, what if I made them sequential? What if it was like, okay, these 15 are, you're going to be 172.16.0. You're going to be dot one. You're going to be dot two. You're going to be dot three. You're going to be dot four. And I sequentially line up their address blocks. Now I can summarize. Okay. So it takes network planning as part of the network design process. It's, it's part of you know, you, you might have to re-IP your, your network in order to do this. I've, I've participated in that with companies who have said, you know what, we, we, want, we need to start summarizing. We're large enough, but we didn't really build this out right. Like, oh, okay, well, let's go out and you have to re-IP some of your branch sites or what have you so that you can start to summarize those to the rest of the network. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and configure this. First of all, we need some networks to summarize. We don't really have anything to summarize right now. So let's go ahead and make some loopback addresses and we'll summarize those. So router three, um, yes, I'm gonna do it like this. Well, okay, so looking at the diagram, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make like four loopback addresses on router three and I'm going to get onto router one. I'm gonna summarize those routes towards router two, okay? So let's just, for the sake of this, Let's go ahead and shut down those other two links. So S33, I'm gonna shut this down. And the link to router four, I'm going to shut this down. Okay, so now my only path to router two is through router one. Okay, ideally, the other you know the other problem with summarization, summarization usually happens out at the edge, not really in the core. And we have all of these, this full mesh, near full mesh of connections among these four routers. It's practically like your network core. I mean, if I really wanted to effectively summarize, I'd have to summarize from router three out. So for this example, let's just simplify our network. Now it's just router three connecting to router one, router one talking to router two. Okay, so let's make those loopback interfaces. Interface loopback zero, IP address 
let's make this um, I don't know three dot three dot zero dot zero yeah let's do that uh, two five five dot zero um, whoops oh <laughs> right I was thinking about the network dot three two fifty five two five two five dot zero and then we have interface loopback one IP address three dot three dot one dot three two fifty five two to five no oh, there we go dot zero and then interface loopback two IP address three dot three dot two dot three and you were lining up that third octet with the uh, loopback number so interface loopback three IP address finally we get to three dot three dot three dot three that seems like a good um, ID so let's go ahead and get into our router EIGRP 100 configuration and we're going to add the network statements for these so network 3.3. Now hold up, hold up. We could actually have some fun here. Um, we we could advertise all four of those links with one network statement. And I could just take the easy way out. We'll see how. Yeah, watch watch me blow this. Um, but let's let's try to hit. Let's try to make this right. So 3.3.0.0. What be the wildcard mask for this? We care about the first three. We care about the second three. Now. This third octet is is the problem because we know it's going to be dot x dot two fifty five, right? I mean, we we know that there's there's going to be some level of of this. So how many addresses do we have? And we've got four, so zero through three would be the answer there. So so actually, it should be three. Yay, fun! Yeah, I know wildcard masks, right? Good times. So let's see if this works. We're going to try to use one network statement to activate all four links at once, but also contain it. So we're only activating those three um, or those four links. And so let's go ahead and take a look at router one and we'll say show IP route EIGRP. Let's see if we've got them all up. Oh, we do look at that. Well, as best I can tell, we did it right with the wildcard mask. So that's good. So um, we have four routes now coming to router one and router two should see the same thing. Let's see, do show IP route EIGRP. And we do, okay, good. We've got four different routes and that's too many. Let's let's get this down to one. So we could summarize actually on router three, but let's summarize in router one. So router one's going to know that there are four real routes and it's going to lie to router two and convince router two that there's only one. Again, this configuration is just like some of the other ones I mentioned earlier, it goes onto the interface. So we get onto this interface, interface gig one slash zero, hit enter. And we're going to do a summary address. So IP, again, you'd, you'd think it'd be IP EIGRP, but it's IP summary dash address. Um, then we can see, ah, this is the one where it was ripping EIGRP. All right, so I'm not crazy at least. So EIGRP, we're gonna pick, and then 100 for the autonomous system number. And here's where we enter the summary IP address. So. I can, there, there's nothing stopping me from summarizing this big, right? Like I could say three dot, I could, I could do this three dot zero dot zero dot zero slash eight. Does this contain those four networks? Yes. Is it the most effective way to summarize? No, it's not. If for example, a, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm telling router two that I can get to this entire slash eight. The reality is I can get to a very teeny tiny part of it. So let's let's try to be more more specific. Um, those all started with 3.3. .3, so I could do this 3.3.0.0 slash 16. Is that more accurate? Yes, it's more accurate. Is it the most accurate? No, no, it's really not. <laughs> um, so how many bits are really changing? Well, only two bits are changing, right? Um, because I'm only changing four, uh, or I've got four networks. It starts with zero and I'm, I'm making that zero, one, two, and three. Well, in binary that's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So no matter what, it's just two bits. So I could actually summarize this with a 24 minus two is a slash 22. Okay, this would be the best way to summarize this network. All right. So let's go ahead and try this 3.3.0.0 slash 22. And the yeah, EIGRP is going to do a little bit of a pseudo hiccup. It's kind of funny. Um, it's, it says it's going to resync because there is a summary configured. Configuring a summary 
if it didn't update, if it didn't send, if it didn't trigger an update um, to its neighbor, it would not affect the neighbor, right? Remember what we said, EIGRP only sends updates when it needs to. So this is a situation where it needs to send an update and it just sent one. So let's go ahead and take a look at router two up here. And we're going to run the exact same command and find that it's a little different. So 3.0.0.0 slash 22, that would be the summary address that I configured. And it's able to get to it via router one. So let's make sure I've got config or connectivity. Let's ping, what was it? 3.3.0.3. And I can get there. Dot one dot three. I can get there. Two dot three. That one looks good. And last but not least, 3.3. So I can get to all four of those subnets. So I, so I correctly subnetted <laughs> um, and uh, I narrowed it down to just those four subnets. So technically, I mean, summary addresses, this is something that they could ask on the Encore exam, especially would be this exact scenario where they want you to identify the most efficient summary address possible. Okay. So that's where, um, yeah, anyways. So, so if they ask us that question, we need to be prepared to answer that and to say, okay, yeah, it would, you know, scrolling back up here, right? Well, actually looking at router one, you know, is it, is it this, is it this slash 22? Is it a slash 20? Is it a slash 18? Is it a slash 16? And you're going to have to be able to summarize that. So, so be aware of that. Understand how, how summary addresses work. You do notice, by the way, automatically rescinded the backend routes, which we'd expect, but just something to pay attention to is I'm not advertising the summary and those four routes. Four didn't become five, four truly became one. So it's suppressing all of those routes that fall into this slash 22. Okay, shaving a haircut, see fun. I, I, that must be a reference to something that I don't get, but <laughs> unless you're telling me I need a shave and a haircut, but I feel like, I feel like that's probably not the case. Um, all right, very good. Well, I think that about covers it for tonight. I don't see any other questions. Airbag facial, hello. Um, you're joining just in time for us to say goodbye. <laughs> um, but hey, welcome. And welcome to our Tuesday night CCNA training. We cover CCNA topics every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. That said, note. Um, oh, hey, thank you very much for the uh, follow there, Airbag. Um, that said, next week I am taking the night off. It is my wife's birthday. So I, you know, I, I did this. I subnetted on my birthday because that was fun, but I didn't feel like I should um, subnet on her birthday somehow. So, um, <laughs> taking the night off next week, it'll be a nice break from, from the routine. So everybody, um, study up on, you know, just make sure you keep progressing with your studies as, as needed. Um, when we come back on the, it should be the 25th of February, the two weeks from tonight, the new CCNA will have launched. The new CCNA launches on February 24th. We're going to meet February 25th. We're going to pull up that CCNA blueprint we're going to explore it, look at all of the new concepts, any questions and answers or, or you know, Q&A time. Um, so bring your questions, bring your concerns about the new CCNA, and we'll have a lot of fun diving into that. All right. Um, airbag, studying for CCNA in 2020. I will be back for sure. Awesome. Very good. Yeah, please. In two weeks, it'll be really relevant because we'll be looking right at the CCNA blueprint and seeing all of the fun things that they're adding. So, all right, everyone. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. Have a good night.